skirt stick can be tricky. <laughs> Given how thin it is, it can easily come out well done, tough and chewy. But if you treat it right, you can get one of the most tender and beefy pieces of meat. The knowledge involved might be big, but the work is actually tiny. This dish takes 15 minutes of active time. Here, let me show you. So the first rookie mistake is buying crappy meat. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is no such thing as free lunch. There seems to be a very strong correlation between the price the store charges for the skirt steak and how tender it is. With high-end steaks, there are labels that can give you an idea about the marbling and texture. Prime is the most tender and marbled. But that's for ribeyes and New York strips. I've never seen prime skirt steak sold in my local stores. That being said, the supermarket that charges the most for it in my area, Wegmans, tends to sell skirt steak that is almost as tender as a prime ribeye, while some of the cheaper options available at other stores can be rather tough and grisly. So experiment with different stores until you find the one that you like best. Also, don't be fooled by low prices. Some of those steaks are completely untrimmed, and once you remove all the grizzle, they're not as cheap after all. Whether you buy it at the butcher counter or in a vacuum sealed package, skirt steak is almost always folded to make it look thicker than it actually is. If you're buying it at the butcher's counter, ask them to unwrap it and show you how thick it actually is. If you're buying it in a package like I did, take a look at the side to figure out its real thickness. Ideally, I want most of my steak to be around half an inch. There will always be some thin parts like here, but I don't want all my steak to be paper thin. Cut your steak into sections of similar thickness. This way you can take really thin parts of the heat sooner. Now that we have a good skirt steak, we need to trim it. Insert the knife under the fat and cut to the right to give yourself a flap. Then flip the knife over and cut to the left. If you're left, you do a mirror image of this. A little bit of fat is a good thing. It will help you produce instant browning, but if you have too much fat, you might produce outrageous flare-ups and end up with a steak that tastes like soot. You want the fat layer to be spotty and about one millimeter thick. If you encounter any silver skin, trim it completely. I have no silver skin on my steak today, so I'll borrow footage from my rack of lamb video to show you what it looks like. It's a very tough membrane. There is no way to rip it with your hands. Fat, on the other hand, is very soft and can easily be ripped with your hands. In the end, you want zero silver skin, but some fat. The next rookie mistake of cooking a skirt steak, or any steak for that matter, is salting it at the wrong time. We need a very dry steak. We can't afford to wait for the moisture to evaporate, since that will delay browning and will risk overcooking the steak by the time it finally browns. Salt draws the moisture to the surface, which is not good for browning. There are two ways to solve this problem. The first option is to dry the steak very thoroughly with paper towels and salt it right before placing it on the grill before it gets all sweaty. The second option is to salt it in advance and put it back in the fridge and let the salt absorb and then dry the steak before cooking. That's what I did. I salted my steak the night before, but even two hours would be sufficient. By the way, you can totally add some pepper to your salt if you like it. As you might know from my recent video, I grill on gas, so that's what I'll cover today. If you're one of the vocal charcoal fans, I doubt you need my help with getting your grill hot enough. The gas folks, listen up. You need your grill to be extremely clean and extremely hot. I got my grill all messy so that I could show you how to clean the grate. 
Cover the area where you plan to grill with a double layer of foil. Don't wrap it tightly around the grill. In fact, it helps to mold the foil slightly so that it hovers right above the grill grates. Under no circumstances should you wrap the entire grill grate. For safety reasons, you need good air circulation. The first time you do this, keep a very close watch on your grill. Some people never disassemble and clean their grills inside, which means that they have a whole pool of grease sitting under their grates. You don't want the grease to ignite. Some grills react very well to this technique, and some don't. Cook's Illustrated published it years ago, and it has served me and many other people extremely well. But I've also heard of this technique backfiring, <laughs> no pun intended. Now preheat your grill for 20 minutes and pay absolutely no attention to that useless thermometer on the lid. It knows what's happening on the lid, not what's happening on the grate. After 20 minutes, everything on the grate will turn to ash and your grate will be really hot. Remove the foil quickly but thoroughly clean the grate with a brush replace the foil for a couple of minutes and you're ready to grill the next mistake is grilling your steak naked some steak simply needs salt and pepper skirt steak is not one of those it needs to be dressed up a bit that's why we need the glaze yes that very one you've seen in a gazillion of my videos. I have a video that explains in great detail why the secret weapon produces insanely quick browning and phenomenal flavor. Here's what we'll need. One garlic clove grated on a microplane zester, 15 grams soy sauce, 15 grams of pomegranate molasses, 15 grams of Dijon mustard, 5 grams of za'atar, that that's totally optional, and 100 grams of canola grapeseed or some other flavorless oil. But I found that lately I've been using less oil than I originally called for, so if you want to stop at 70 grams of oil, you'll get a more intense glaze. I never measure anything for this unless I'm testing a recipe for you. This is not like baking, so feel free to eyeball everything. Shake really well before using to make sure the mixture is homogeneous. For all the questions about this glaze, ingredient substitution, storage, doing it in a bowl instead of a squeeze bottle, watch the video linked below. This is a surface treatment. There is no need to soak your meat in it. Right before grilling, dry your steak really well with paper towels and drizzle it with a little glaze. Then rub it in to create an even thin layer. No, you won't need all the glaze, so save the rest of it in the fridge for all your future grilling projects. It works on all meats, fish, poultry, and veggies. Now we need to move quickly so that we don't lose the heat. Remove the foil and brush the grill with an oiled paper towel. Place the steak on the grill, starting with the thickest piece and ending with the thinnest. Cover the grill. Set the timer for a minute and a half. That's the longest that we can stay on the first side. Take a peek at 30 seconds to see if you get color. I did. So I'll flip my tiny piece and rotate my big piece to get more grill marks. After 30 more seconds, I got crisscross grill marks, so I'm going to flip. If your steak is not brown yet, give it the full minute and a half. Now we'll do the same thing on the other side, but this little guy needs to come out. 30 seconds, rotate, 30 seconds, and the second side is brown. Now I'm going to give my steak another 30 seconds on the first and another 30 seconds on the second side. To make a long story short, We've only been grilling for three minutes and we did a lot of flipping. I'm sure you want to know why, right? <laughs> the more we flip, the more evenly our steak will cook. This helps us avoid a gray overcooked outside. Remove your steaks to a warm plate and let them rest for three to four minutes before cutting. I'll top them with some cilantro lime butter, but that's totally optional. Don't worry, once we finish talking about the steak, I'll show you how to make the butter. 
testing a thin stick for dentists is a hopeless undertaking. It's almost impossible to insert a thermometer into such a thin stick to get an accurate reading. People often spend so much time fussing with the thermometer that their stick overcooks. You are welcome to poke it with your finger if that makes you feel like you're doing something. But that's completely unreliable. <laughs> you also need to be somewhat flexible with how done it will be inside, since it's not perfectly even. Since I would rather eat a steak that's too rare than a steak that's too well done, I limit myself to three minutes of total cooking for a half inch thick steak. Realistically, it's probably closer to four minutes since I have to stop and restart the timer and while I'm flipping, the timer is not going. If you prefer to err on the side of more done, go for five minutes of total cooking, flipping your steak every minute. Also keep in mind that no two grills are the same. So keep notes on your process so that you know how to tweak it the next time. If you slice your steak with the grain, you'll need to serve dental floss with it. Skirt is a fibrous steak and it needs to be sliced against the grain. Here is the grain of my meat. See those little lines? I promise in real life it's kind of obvious. So this is the direction of my cuts, perpendicular to the grain. I also like to tilt my knife so that I get wider pieces. And that, my friends, is a fabulous skirt steak. So about that butter, just like my grilling glaze, it's an all-purpose condiment that will take any grilled food from good to fantastic. I grated one garlic clove on a microplane zester. I only used half of it because it was so big. Added the zest of one lime, a little pile of cilantro, thin stems are fine, but I did remove thick ones four tablespoons of unsalted room temperature butter, a squirt of lime juice, a pinch of cayenne or red chili flakes, and salt. If using salted butter, skip the salt. If I wasn't serving this to my spice-averse children, I'd make it spicier. And mush it all together. Don't worry about the juice separating from the butter. It will all mix together when it melts on the steak. Just like with the glaze, this is way more than we need for a one pound steak. Expect to use maybe two or three teaspoons for a pound of meat, but it's silly to make a little bit of this. Just make a bunch, put it in your fridge and use within one week on anything you like. You can even freeze it. That's all the well-seasoned advice I have for you for today. Here are more thought-provoking culinary videos for you to check out. And if you are ever in the Boston area, maybe I'll see you in one of my classes.